Uh, welcome everyone. Um, the next talk is about uh, Istio and uh, uh, Andrew will uh, uh, take us through it. Uh, have fun. Thank you very much. Right, hello everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we are going to talk about Istio today and uh, we're going to look at it in some depth. Um, if we get through to the end, there is uh, an addendum to this talk. Um, and I think with a little bit longer than it normally takes to deliver it in, we might be able to talk about some of the threats uh, for compromised workloads in Istio as well. But we'll start off by looking at the Istio proposition. So, hello, my name is Andy. I am a, a technical milliner. Um, you could say I'm a build fanatic and an advocate of continuous everything. I'm a co-founder at Control Plane, which is continuous infrastructure and security engineering with a focus on containerized deployments. And I've done a little bit of everything from database administration through development, operations, pen testing. And I want to talk about service meshes, network threats, and enhancing network security. And I'm going to make a bold claim, and it's going to sound a lot like this. Service meshes are the solution to network security. I will try and quantify that. Why? Because we can't trust anything. The internet was built with trust between everything. And unlike the origins of the internet, we are no longer just a bunch of academics running trusted workloads. More and more critical systems and light bulbs and toasters are being put online. And traditional perimeter security, firewalling, DMZs, are provably not enough to keep systems secure. So, we try to sandbox everything. Systems, applications, unfortunately this involves a huge amount of re-implementation. Everybody has their own sandbox. Of course, containers are just the kernel's view on process sandboxing and many other different namespace mechanisms. And Istio is a networking sandbox providing application layer security and advanced routing capability. This, of course, does not preclude the configuration of all the other sandboxing and security features provided by containers and thus the kernel and your infrastructure provider. So, Istio is so hot right now, it will not solve distributed transactions, but it will solve load balancing, fault tolerance, traffic routing and shaping, request tracing and observability, and end-to-end -end enhanced network policy and inter-service security. Whew. The network is unreliable and service meshes are here to help. But it's really complex. Uh, it's good because it's solving hard problems that everybody struggles with and re-implements, but if we don't understand the mechanisms and the security features that it offers, we can't be sure that we're going to use them correctly. There are quite a number of features in a service mesh that we'll get into. So, what will we do? We'll examine the old way how this new secure transport is achieved, the mechanisms for bootstrapping trust, and the security and observability enhancements that Istio promises, and if time allows, some threat vectors that are still to be fixed. So, to history. Netflix set the scene for microservice in general, commoditizing distributed systems in particular, with a slew of libraries over the past 10 years of cloud. Uh, their suite of tooling became JVM-based industry standard, but does not offer much in terms of cross-language compatibility. There are other things we need to stand up as developers to match Istio's feature set, and the most heinous of those is, of course, internal PKI. Nobody likes it, it's actually quite difficult, and if you base all your security on it, at some point you're probably having a bad day. So, for zero downtime releases, we'd also need perhaps some advanced DNS routing or something plugged into the fabric um, of our software-defined networking. So Istio promises to centralize all these complex and varying concerns with a service mesh. And a service mesh has two major components which are common to any network. They are the data plane, also known as the network, or fabric, copper, fiber, 
and the control plane, which can include hardware routers, switches, their configurations, as well as software bridges, virtual network cards, SDN routing infrastructure, like your cloud provider's routing tables. Istio's data plane is made up of the Envoy proxy en masse. Istio is Envoy many, many times. Every service on the mesh must have a dedicated Envoy proxy sat in front of it. And Envoy is also used for the ingress and egress gateways. Actually, any proxy that conforms to Envoy's API can integrate with Istio, but that just at the moment means Envoy by itself. Each Envoy instance is used in proxy mode and deployed as a sidecar to each instance of a service on the mesh. Separately, that's the data plane, the control plane centralizes the configuration of each of those Envoy proxies and writes the configuration to Envoy at runtime. Envoy has um, an immutable configuration struct. It's, uh, it's modern C++ is the, uh, is the implementation. And that means that the configuration can be treated as immutable and each connection just points or has a pointer to a version of that configuration. That means you can use the API to reconfigure Envoy and it can run with multiple different configurations in parallel at the same time. That essentially means you don't have to SIG up to reload configuration and Envoy then by extension supports zero downtime reconfiguration. Super useful. So the pilot um, uh, the pilot control plane component manages and configures the Envoy proxies via the API. It injects information into Envoy at runtime, and then these Envoy sidecars, called so because there are two of them in the mesh, sorry, two of them, there are two, pod, two containers in every pod, one must be Envoy, and it sits beside the main application. These Envoy sidecars mediate and control all networked communications between all of the microservices on the mesh. This is an idealized enforced governance situation. Some requests require centralized information lookup, such as rate limiting requests, for example, and these will also hit the mixer component, which provides, amongst other things, rate limiting and telemetry, which can be used dynamically to make routing decisions on the mesh. This provides a uniform way to secure, connect, and monitor microservices, and also provides security and identity primitives for securing those workloads. And of course, we have zero trust networking, which essentially says, trust nothing and revalidate everything. It's underpinned by dynamic workload identity provided by the Spiffy project, and used as the basis of the TLS certificates that are used for mutual authentication on every connection. This is distinct from user identity, which we would associate with OAuth or JOTS or JWTs and SAML and all those horrible things. So using Spiffy, Istio provides automatic, free, end-to-end -end TLS. Of course, this doesn't prevent remote code execution in a front-end service from directly hitting a database, that is then up to you to decompose your services in a manner that are easily securable via the routing and the RBAC between them. However, what it does do is limit the blast radius. This is a central concept of secure systems design, but of course, Istio is not gonna fix running IDS or a secure network topology but it does allow us to reason and secure about our workload environment more accurately and with a higher degree of fidelity. So, what does Istio consider the feature set of a service mesh? This is supposed to be all zero changes to the application. There is a caveat here. Request context must be proxied for transitive calls in a microservices graph. So if service A is calling service B, there is a request ID that must also be propagated when service B calls service C. Otherwise, our centralized tracing infrastructure has no way of correlating those calls. Often, that's overlooked, 
Um, but that's only required for tracing. A lot of the other things can be done without request context propagation. So, this is kind of what I think of when we think the Istio roadmap and release time. It is really late. It has taken a long time to become ready. And it's still very much a case of buyer beware. There are not production deployment stories. There are lots of people who have got halfway and then rolled back. But the project has strong internal test infrastructure. Um, they are targeting a huge range of platforms in the same way that Kubernetes does. They are aiming to be all things to all men on any infrastructure. And uh, as such, version 1.1, which is due sometime this month, um, will get us closer to production readiness. Of course, never run a 0, 0.0 of any description. Um, I would hope this would be in uh, a non-foot gun state within the next two to three months. And I would encourage you, if you're an early adopter, to jump in now and just see what happens. So how does this all work? Using the service mesh construct, a dedicated network, which is the only way for services to communicate. In old school networks, a node was connected to its neighbors. Then we moved to a star topology, or hub and spoke. And a mesh is a network with multiple routes between individual nodes. This sounds simple, but when spanning network segments or whole networks, it can be very complicated. And the extreme example, a fully connected network is the sort of service mesh that we want. Every node is able to talk directly to every other node. So let's have a look at a concrete implementation. In Istio's case, every node has a persistent TCP connection to every other node. This is the mesh. This is actually an HTTP2 connection, so we're using standard protocols. Entry to the mesh is granted to each application via a proxy. There is one proxy per instance of a service, and each Envoy proxy connects to every other proxy on the mesh, opens the communication channels by default. The mesh is still transiting over the Kubernetes container network interface network, so uh, be that Weave or Calico or whatever it is that you're using, but it's re-encrypted. So the mesh is a set of encrypted HTTP2 connections between dedicated proxy servers. Istio is just a load of Envoy sidecars, and each Envoy runs as a sidecar in a pod containing the application to be added to the mesh. Don't forget, a pod is just a network namespace, so Envoy is able to use IP tables to send all traffic coming in or out of that network namespace directly to itself. So Envoy consumes everything, and uh, without whitelisting, by default, all traffic out of the uh, sorry out of the application is intercepted and rewritten by Envoy. All services are isolated from the network and can only access any other network address internally or externally through this dedicated Envoy sidecar proxy. The proxy intercepts all traffic. This is our opportunity to apply controls, enforce governance, our rate limiting, um, to trace and gather metrics and monitor the application. And we also have various high availability network routing implementations. This is because Envoy is able to emit metrics and then central routing decisions can be made by the control plane components, which know if a service, if an instance of a service is degrading and responding more slowly, it will just route around it. It will go to other instances of that service. This is a higher level of system visibility than any individual network library could have by itself. So we're taking advantage of this centralization of routing to make more informed routing decisions. Yes, OK, we've covered most of that. So what does this also mean? It means that we can speak plain text traffic from the application to the network, in inverted commas, have that connection intercepted and terminated by Envoy, which then rebundles it in a TLS connection and performs a mutual TLS negotiation with the target service. So we have authentication 
from both ends of the connection, and we can then apply RBAC controls onto the connection. That's HTTP verbiage, path, and uh, verbiage and path, yeah, layer seven, as well as any other header or HTTP information that is conveyed because we have everything in plain text, because the security is applied by Envoy and not by the application. So, a mesh is a single communications layer in which every node connects to as many other nodes as possible. This can span across multiple networks. It can dynamically reorganize and reconfigure itself. And this also provides us some fault tolerance by abstracting away the underlying hardware and routing infrastructure. This is not a new concept. Um, tools like WeaveNet and Docker Swarm will do this by default as well. But a service mesh builds upon the mesh communication layer to provide extra network level functionality only for applications that wish to join it. So from this simplistic diagram of the data plane to the whole system. This slide features in every Istio talk ever, so I thought I'd conform. How do we get some free security? Well, let's take a moment to pause this. We care about the data flow right now, the blue traffic, the encrypted data between applications that Istio is stewarding. And this is the mesh flattened to show the path of a packet. So we start at point one, ingress from the internet or another network. Point two, TLS is terminated, mesh TLS is then mesh mutual TLS is then negotiated and spoken between the ingress proxy and the sidecar. These are both instances of Envoy using the PKI provided by the control plane's Citadel components in the middle there. Envoy at point three terminates the internal MTLS. It extracts the service's identity from the TLS certificate. So it pulls the SAN and says, this is what we consider secure naming backed off onto TLS chains of trust. It then takes policy decisions. And finally, the, Istio, uh, sorry, the Envoy instance at point three proxies the plain text request to service A. Now they're in the same network namespace. Kubernetes considers that a security boundary. So to all intents and purposes, this fits in with the trust model that we use pods for anyway. Importantly, if Envoy Sorry, Envoy is protocol aware. So we have to annotate the expected connection type or data type that will flow across a connection. If we don't include that information, Envoy will do blind, um, less informed TCP-based load balancing. Um, it currently speaks things like Mongo and Postgres and uh, can perform far more, as I say, informed routing decisions when it can either speak the binary protocol or it knows something is HTTP. So onwards, the application behind service A handles the request and determines that it wants to make a call to service B for a further piece of information. Point four, the plain text HTTP request makes its way out of the third point. It's intercepted by Envoy, which bundles it in TLS, mutually authenticates with an instance of the target service and sends it off over the mesh to service B. At this point, we're using the mesh's resiliency features and abstracting away from even the Kubernetes DNS. This is the Istio virtual service abstraction, which sits above Istio's service and DNS. This is all provided transparently. Of course, uh, it's still possible to get off the mesh, and we will discuss some of that later. Um, and so one can still, of course, access non-mesh services with the correct configuration. So. Um, we are creating a further overlay, essentially, on top of the CNI overlay. So multiple layers of overlay networking. And we also have another magical feature here. Envoy is able to provide its own form of health checking. Because it knows where everything is, then it is able to identify the health of a service and extra additional aggregated information, like its response latency. So. We are now at point five. The receiving Envoy performs all the same actions as Envoy did at point two. It terminates the MTLS. It applies any routing or policy decisions, and then it reverse proxies back to the application behind it. 
there are various other things that we go into um, that we've covered briefly before. So we now, at point five, have decided that we want to make a call to some other service hosted outside of the mesh. Let's call this a hosted MongoDB instance for the point of argument. So we get to point six. The request is TLS wrapped once again by Envoy. We're speaking MTLS with a new connection and perfect forward secrecy at every hop of the mesh. And we head to the egress proxy. The egress proxy is uh, a layer seven proxy that is able to give us a whitelist of domains that we're allowed to hit. This is distinct from the Kubernetes layer three and four network policy model, where DNS is considered to be non-deterministic and unenforceable. Um, Istio jumps at the problem and uh, gives us layer seven interception that is a replacement for something like trying to unbundle TLS in Squid and perform policy decisions there. So at this point, we have fired a packet from external to the mesh all the way through out to a third party service. And of course, the duplex element of the request would follow that whole thing back and make a load of uh, the response calls would end up in service A at point three, and then a nice response would be returned uh, back to the user. Okay, here's the same diagram, but with a focus on the services in the mesh, and a reminder that everything has to go through these sidecar proxies. So what we see here labeled Istio proxy, that is the name of the container, that is bundling up Envoy. So we can see uh, in this case, we've got uh, some load testing happening. JMeter speaks to the ingress gateway. It uses the virtual service abstraction to do its ingress style routing. This is distinct from Kubernetes service DNS abstraction. And here we are routing to an instance of the service handling uh, authentication, booking, the various RESTful endpoints. And uh, then we have an external service that we can see from the customer service. Um, that requires a service entry to get off the mesh. So, yeah, the Mongo protocol is spoken natively by Envoy at this point. Redis, MySQL, and various other things are on the way. So, that's Istio from a high level. Now let's examine our threat model. We have a lot of potential attack vectors in a modern web application. Insiders, hijacked services, microser microservice attack surfaces, uh, workload mobility, Brittle fine grain models, audit and compliance, and courtesy of Louis Ryan, the Istio team lead, this is the threat model that we are looking at. So let's see what services are deployed by Istio and how they relate to this model. A lot of things get installed. Istio has an a la carte option where one is able to cherry pick bits and bobs and actually to integrate Istio with an existing running system, that would be highly recommended. Um, the reality of the situation, in my opinion, is that one is better standing up entirely segregated production-like infrastructure and testing this as if it, was, as if it were a further pre-prod environment. Because there are lots of moving parts. So, Pilot deals with writing configuration to the Envoy API. This is a declarative model like the rest of the cloud native evolution, um, which makes it easier at least to statically analyze and verify. Mixer is our centralized metadata and policy, um, an auditor's dream, assuming it's cryptographically verified and shipped outside the cluster in case of tampering. Citadel is the certificate authority for Istio. Um, that obviously issues and rotates TLS certificates on the hour. Um, it's currently undergoing some work to make it pluggable with Vault, which means that it then becomes naturally integrated into KMS and Cloud HSM um, and actual HSMs. There is, uh, th there's obviously a balance there between keeping key material inside the cluster versus control of key material outside the cluster. Um, I, my personal preference would be have the whole thing generated inside the cluster, never let the secrets or the private keys out, and then the only way to get to them is to compromise the cluster, at which point you've probably got a worse day than um, a breaking of your transport protocol encryption. Um, of course, for certain 
uh, organizations, not centrally managing certificate authorities is impossible, but nevertheless, I think it's actually slightly less secure. There we are. Uh, Galley is a user-supplied config validator for the rest of the control plane. It's uh, only recently been added to Istio and is still uh, in progress. The sidecar injector. This is a self-hosted pod that is called as an admission controller. So this will take the pod manifest that's been submitted to a namespace, and it will inject YAML for the proxy, which is IP tables configuration, and also for the Envoy sidecar proxy itself. So it takes the YAML that you give it and just splices in some extra YAML in the middle. That has to run inside your cluster to be an endpoint to actually perform that transformation step. Then we have Proxy, which is the foot soldier of the Istio revolution. Um, proxy Debug, which is Envoy plus some debug symbols. Probably shouldn't see that deployed. Uh, proxy Init. This, I'm pleased to say, is just a bunch of bash that wraps IP tables that reconfigures the networking inside the network namespace that is shared by the init containers and the Istio proxy and our application itself. We'll have a look at that shortly. Uh, Grafana, Jaeger, and Prometheus are in there too. Um, there's, there's actually an awesome project, which I haven't got in these slides, from uh, Stefan Prodan, who is one of the Weave developer advocates, who has written the continuous deployment tool for Istio that deploys a canary service, Dark, routes production traffic to it, and monitors the Prometheus metrics that are coming from it to see if it passes KPIs. It's kind of a lightweight spinnaker um, it, it's super cool. I would strongly recommend you look at it if you want to have a look at this. It's just been integrated into Jenkins X. It'll turn up in Weave Cloud soon. Um, of course, it's an open source project. And then finally, the StatsD exporter, which is a StatsD bridge for Prometheus. So, yes, a bit more detail there. Um, this is what I think of when I think about images pulled and run straight from the Docker Hub. So instead of just running everything as root and throwing caution to the wind, we can treat all of our workloads as hostile and apply more granular network policies with Istio. This is a reimagination of the way that we would traditionally deploy things, but if we're working on a zero trust basis, then we can initially use containers as a far more granular hook onto which to hang our policy, because if we're running a single process per container, then we are able to treat that container in the most locked down manner possible. We don't have to consider multi-tenanting on a single host anymore. We can think about single tenanting in a single network namespace with dedicated set comp and app armor controls, dropping all our capabilities, running various things like enforcing which UID processes run as. Um, there is still a, an ongoing debate about running containers as root. Um, and I mean running the Linux processes inside the container's root. There are no user namespaces enabled in Docker or Kubernetes. That means root zero inside the container is root zero outside the container. We fudge this with set comp and layered security controls and other LSMs depending on our operating system. But if we run a privileged container and we are the root user inside the container, we are the root user on the host. We can sniff network traffic. We can look at what's running on loop back on the host. We can remount disks from the host as writable. It's root. Well, it's, it's rooting of the host. So there, there should be no reason to run as root inside a container unless you are doing something that breaks the container abstraction, like mounting in a data directory for some local work. Then you need to churn the contents of those files. You need to probably give yourself permission on the Docker socket if you want to run as non-root. Um, as I say, it's still seemingly an ongoing conversation, but we should never be running anything as root inside a container. Triple golden bags is no returns. Right, on to Envoy. Envoy sits next to each service in that service's own network namespace, as with any pod, and intercepts all requests and applies Istio's policy. And it provides network transparency. Istio applications are not aware that they're being proxied on the mesh. It provides a loopback bypass for local proxy-aware applications. Um, so that means you can access layer seven services via local host instead of having to use a VIP. And it 
uh, it offers some security. Um, it avoids granting unnecessary privileges by running an init container, which is highly privileged, and then that container stops, its privileges go, but the namespace is still configured. This is actually under active development because v2, oh, well, I say v2, the next iteration of the init container model is to use a CNI plugin. So Istio 1.1 comes with an optional use CNI, which means it installs and configures itself outside of the process's understanding. It doesn't use the init container model. It uses something already running as privileged on the host. It's better in some ways. It also um, might break other things. There are still some interesting balances. Pod security policies don't entirely work with Istio because you need to be um, a root user to configure some of this stuff and get some caps. And uh, Yes, we might get to more of this depending on how much uh, waffling I do. So, yeah, so, so this is uh, courtesy of Christian Poster, and we can see there all our upstreams are just other pods, and we've got direct envoy to envoy communication in all the other pods, and uh, these filters and listeners are how envoy is pulling all that traffic and routing it to itself. Uh, well, it's the byproduct of, of that change. Mentioned this briefly as the webhook target. A sidecar is injected automatically into a pod if the namespace of that pod is correctly annotated with this annotation. If it is, then a mutating webhook, which receives all requests, if, uh, if this is configured, then the webhook will say, right, so this is going into a namespace that is tagged Istio inject. I will perform my YAML splice, and in goes my nick container, and Envoy. And here is the webhook admission controller that actually mutates the pod definition to uh, create the container and add some extra YAML. This is what a pod looks like when Envoy has been injected. Of note is that the proxy and the proxy init containers are both quite heavyweight. They're the same base image configuration with different runtime behavior. The init container configures the namespace and requires the kernel capability cap or cap net admin. Um, to those of you that are familiar, that gives you administrative control over network interactions, and it means you can do stuff like set your network adapter to promiscuous mode and sniff all the traffic, and various other nasty things you would never want a workload to do. So, Envoy uses this for some compatibility. Again, this is, uh, in, in Istio uh, land, this is a problem of trying to target multiple different deployment types. Even OpenShift and Kubernetes are different enough to require different integrations. But Istio shuts this pod down in the init flow. So init containers run before the actual containers in a pod, and they must complete before the containers in the pod are actually started. So theoretically, we have a suitable boundary here. Um, there is, there's no known attacks or theoretical ways to get around that. So we start up this privileged container, we reconfigure our network namespace, we shut down, and then in steps Envoy and our application already pre-configured into the correct network environment. Let's have a look at what that proxy init init container is doing. I'm very happy to note that the world is run on Bash. And the networks that glue Bash together are marshaled with IP tables. Container networking is just all IP tables. And Istio is no exception. I present Istio IP tables dot sh. The init script responsible for setting up port forwarding to Envoy. It's configured directly in the Kubernetes deployment YAML by the sidecar injector and is the interface to allow white or black listing of port and IP ranges, next generation network security configured in Bash. Enforced by IP tables. And with some hidden gems, like SSH is not handled by Envoy. No SDO for you, SSH. What is that doing in the container anyway, you may well ask? I don't know the answer. Uh, there's a localhost exclusion. 
so we can continue to talk to Layer 7, to other members of the pod, and some um, IP white and blacklisting. Finally, drop IPv6 if configured to do so. Otherwise, IPv6 can do what it likes. Um, props to you if you've got an IP6, IPv6 container network going in the first place, uh, let alone trying to use Istio on it. So that is the init of a container. Now let's have a look at what Envoy is doing. So Sidecar is automatically injected if the namespace is correctly annotated. And we can query the status of the mesh with uh, something that I'm trying to call ist ioctl. I, I hope you'll jo join me on this holy war. Um, so we can query the status of the mesh, mesh with, with ish ioctl and retrieve information about cluster configuration for the Envoy instance in the specified pod. So that's all very nice. We can see the mesh between services here. That's the layer four stuff, all IP and port based. But what about the layer seven TLS security? So a reminder, the mesh is an encrypted, always open, persistent HTTP2 network, which connects each proxy to every other proxy. Traffic over this mesh is then encrypted again with MTLS and encapsulated, ensuring the cryptographic identity of the calling service is known and not only possibly spoofed in the HTTP header. A brief foray into public key cryptography as a reminder, simply a way to send messages that only the intended recipient can receive. We hang the public key next to the box because this is public information. This is beginning the conversation. We then use that public key to encrypt a message, which is one way encrypted. We've started the conversation with the public key, placed it somewhere that it can only then be opened by the private key. We start the conversation with the public key, we end it with the private key, and of course, mutual TLS is this PKI done twice, once in either direction, with some caveats and some Diffie-Hellman bootstrapping, etc. And of course, we're just using standard certificate path trust validation. Um, a, a note here, um, apologies for those of you who are at FOSDEM because I belabor the same point for a moment. Self-signed certificates on the public internet are bad. They are obviously the sign of somebody messing with the connection or being present on some box in between us and our endpoint. Um, however, the way this is done in cloud native terms tends to be the generation of an ephemeral self-signed certificate authority that is only alive for as long as the cluster that it's in. Those keys don't leave the cluster, and the trust boundary becomes physically root on those nodes. Uh, this is because many other things hang off the same trust boundary. Getting to root in a Kubernetes cluster is a pretty bad day for most people involved. Um, I've got a continuous, secure, continuous Kubernetes security talk with some pointers, but essentially if one is not running the node authorizer, um, RBAC plugin, and admission controller, then Compromise of a single kubelet means that you can just request other secrets that that kubelet um, could possibly need to start a pod. Whereas if you use the node authorizer, then the kubelet is only able, the kubelet's credentials are only able to request secrets for applications that have already been scheduled to itself. So it's a minor distinction, but it's incredible how far that goes to hardening um, the, the breach or compromise resilience of a Kubernetes cluster. But going back, those keys being signed internally to the cluster means that we don't have to worry about the protection of that key material and people theoretically signing things outside of the cluster lifecycle. Istio has the same, uh, the same idea. Its cluster CA sits within the mesh. It's pluggable with Vault, as I say, and you can now back that off to your uh, cloud provider. But it's more places to lock down the key material. Uh, it's, it's an open discussion. I'm happy to talk about this afterwards if anybody has strong opinions either way. But what we do with the fact that we have this shared certificate bundle inside the cluster is TLS twice. Uh, mutual TLS is just a second certificate exchange after the client has authenticated itself to the server. This, this establishes a two-way trust mechanism that guarantees the identities of both parties and it's a good thing. 
This is done by Kubernetes because it has API. Um, it has certificate authorities all over the place, in fact. I think there are seven different, uh, uh, different certificate authorities. But at the application layer, this is done with Spiffy. This is done with secure naming. So exactly the same principles. We are um, taking a controlled, self-signed, in-cluster certificate authority. We are finding metadata out about our workloads. We're encoding that metadata into a certificate, or actually into an X509. And that X509 comes back in the CSR, and we are able to generate a TLS certificate for some properties of a workload. This is the essence of Spiffy. Um, this is, uh, in a rudimentary fashion, how Istio implements Spiffy. And what it does is it uses this information for a mutually TLS validated secure naming service. Once we have cryptographic guarantees in the identity of a workload, we're then able to hang other things off that. So RBAC policy, rate limiting, we actually know for sure which instance of a service, ultimately we will know for sure which instance of a service is making those requests. Right now, this is uh, rudimentary and I'll get into more detail. Um, as you can see, the Spiffy ID, which is this combination of metadata um, properties, is encoded in the SAN of the TLS certificate, and so it is utilized on all um, connection negotiations. Uh, and of course, everything being HTTP2, a lot of those are persistent anyway. So how does this work? This is Citadel. This is the certificate authority. Here we can see the contents of the OCI image tarball for the Citadel component. Um, you can see that it's come from scratch. The root file system has the components that are added by the container runtime um, on the right-hand side there. And then what the developers have actually added is the Istio Certificate Authority application itself, uh, a certificate bundle for resolving TLS chains of trust on the internet at large, um, which is borrowed from Debian in this case. And um, the CA cert licenses, actually. Yeah, so the copyright at the bottom just says GPL Debian. Um, of course, everything else is just generic overlays for containers. This is an example of a really well-built Docker image because it only ships what it requires to run. There is no shell like bash or sh or, sh or zsh. Uh, there's no interpreter like Python or the JVM. Um, why is that important? Because if I get an RCE into a container with anything that allows dynamic code execution and like just piping to the JVM um, or, or passing arguments to the JVM will also do that for you, I can start to pivot. I've got network access. I can take advantage of the fact that there are certificates here and start authenticating with other services. So minimizing the attack surface of tools available to an attacker after they have compromised an application, super nice security posture. Another example of treating all of our workloads as hostile. Scratch images will do this for you. Google have a distribution called DistroLess, which is essentially this. They add um, some locale-specific stuff and some local time stuff, but it's basically a very empty package manager-less um, uh, container image. There are still compromises here because uh, you can run a lot of container images with an immutable root file system, but of course they probably want to write something somewhere for certain applications, like a PID. Uh, the temp directory is generally not possibly immutable. So as long as you can get into a container, you can generally start to pivot quite aggressively. So MVP, minimal viable programs, uh, just what you need and no shells, ideally, or interpreters. Uh, unfortunately, when we pump it through Sysdig, uh, we can see that it actually executes as root. So it was all very well. Unfortunately, they've taken a step too far. Uh, it's difficult to exploit scratch containers, so maybe this doesn't matter so much, but it would be trivial to just run this as a non-root user because this does not require any specific privilege. So what is Citadel actually doing? First of all, it gets the Istio system secret, which is its certificate authority, and the private key of the CA, it enumerates all the service counts. So I've been speaking about per 
process workload identity, Istio version one implements Spiffy in the most generalized and rudimentary fashion. It does this by identifying workloads by the service account that is mounted into them. Now, a well-designed application should have least privilege and a service account that is specific to its use case, or in fact, no service account. So modeling least privilege with Spiffy and the current Istio implementation probably requires creating service accounts that have no privilege, but are a name, and that name is a namespace onto which to hang a TLS certificate. Phase two of this will fix all of that, but unfortunately is not here yet. So once the CA has enumerated all the running services, it then generates these secrets, or in fact checks for their presence and then generates them, um, makes sure there's no, um, makes sure, make sure that keys within expiration window um, are not regenerated, uh, and then is ready for new services to join the mesh. When Envoy is provisioned, it will have those keys um, injected into it, so it has an identity with which to make outbound connections. Um, we spoke about this briefly. The SAN in the TLS naming scheme here is from Spiffy. And Spiffy is a set of open source standards for securely identifying software systems in dynamic and heterogeneous production environments. Spire is a reference implementation. Essentially, uh, what Spiffy is doing in Istio right now is baby steps. What Spire is doing is already some way to running. Um, however, the two are using the same paper and set of standards in Spiffy. The maturity of Spire is um, significantly greater. A Spiffy ID looks like this. So uh, the workload identity, you have a trust domain here on the, well, on the left, and a workload identifier. Uh, when we move that into Kubernetes land, we can see the trust domain is the name of the cluster and the workload identifier. These are the metadata components that identify the workload. This is how we get this dynamic identity. At this point, it's just the service count. However, if one uses an attester for, for example, a virtual machine in AWS, you're going to hit the metadata API with the attester itself, and you're going to pull back the ID of the box, maybe the type of VM that it's using, and use things that you know are already, um, already attest strongly to the identity of something to generate this metadata about it to sign to give it a dynamic workload identity. And it's called dynamic because the nature of the, the inputs for, those, for the metadata selectors, if you like, can change. Once the identity is generated and given to a workload, it's, it's no longer dynamic. There is a strong coupling there because we want to always know where something originated. And then we've got some other benefits, like we can use those keys to cryptographically sign logs to say, these are definitely my logs. They haven't been tampered with, et cetera. So what happens with that Spiffy ID once we have attested to it? It's encoded into an X509, just like we saw earlier, using the certificate extensions to encode further information. Here are those certificate extensions. It's just X509 v3, and of course, we trust it via certificate path validation, just as if it was a certificate on the public internet. So Spiffy is the standard for how an application can retrieve an identity programmatically, and importantly, also generate short-lived credentials that can be used to assert this identity. It also allows the um, generation of a trust bundle, which is, of course, the public keys for the certificate authority that we have used to sign all our workloads in the cluster. And attestation is the process of guaranteeing metadata about an entity. This is phase two attestation. This is where Istio is going. It doesn't work like this now, but it will do soon. The process here is having a node agent. So this is something that is able to gather metadata about a process itself. So that could be, for example, the name of the namespace that it's in and the PID ID, um, or just the namespace, probably in Istio's case. And again, we are just using the chain of trust to guarantee these things. It should be noted that Spiffy itself is not the authentication layer or the authorization on top. It is just the identity that comes before AuthNZ. 
And so back to this diagram. Citadel, the CA, has requested the secure Spiffy name, generated a cert, handed that certificate to Envoy, and Envoy now uses it in the request path for any traffic to the backend server, the process that it is proxying to. This is what Envoy's configuration looks like. It's all API driven, it is all outputable in JSON, and you can see we're just mounting things at well-known locations into the pod, and it's a relatively easy ask to say to Envoy, use this as your identifier. Okay, um, it's not so secure by default in Kubernetes land, as I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, there are a fair few problems. Staying secure by default is not easy. That was supposed to start at the beginning. There we go. Goodbye. Multiple layers of controls are required, and layering Istio RBAC on top of existing Kubernetes network policy provides some protection. However, they are both running IP tables, and unless your CNI provider is aware that Istio is there, you could have some nasty repercussions. So we get security through some RBAC. This is a higher fidelity network policy, in this case, deny by default. Um, we have, uh, at this point, we're creating a service role, allowing service communication within a namespace. This is um, like a service account, but we're giving it to, uh, to an application for its RBAC configuration in Istio. This is RBAC for services and uses the same concepts as RBAC for users in Kubernetes. So the service role service viewer allows read access to any service in the default namespace with a matching destination app label defined as a constraint. It then binds to service role, uh, the service role to the Istio system and my Istio namespace. Namespace is over here. So it's a similar concept to the way that we create a role and bind it in, uh, in Kubernetes. Um, here we're kind of doing the same thing with some HTTP get verbiage. Um, looking at the time, I'm just gonna flick through these. They're still there. Um, and you can see this is how those um, YAML uh, declarations are reflected when we exec into the Istio proxy pod and we pull uh, this configuration back from Envoy on its local API. So it's, it's not hugely complicated, but there are a lot of moving parts. Um, so we also have this capacity to authenticate an end user or a third party user and propagate that context through the system. Uh, this is a replacement for JOTS, essentially. Um, unfortunately, it still is susceptible to the same sort of replay attack. Um, you would have to uh, sort of rotate nonces every time, et cetera. So the angle here is setting very low TTLs or expiry times. The same thing you do in a JOT deployment anyway. Um, yep, so uh, phase one, we're looking at phase two, um, which supports two or more hops for a single request, allows service, -to service calls on behalf of ingress requests from an end user. Um, and the additional part is that we exchange those credentials for an internal uh, an internal token. So it's essentially just providing a handoff to the internal uh, security infrastructure and PKI at ingress to the cluster. Uh, this is called an authentication proof token. And it's produced by the first server in the stack and then forwarded on with, for every request uh, to provide essentially a proof of the user authentication that was identified at the ingress point as a result of the claims that were validated from a third party JOT identity provider. Uh, this is what it looks like. I will not go too much more into this. TLS ingress gateways uh, are nifty. They, they allow us to extend the mesh up to ingress into our infrastructure. Uh, we have egress filtering, um, as uh, we mentioned before. And of course, DNS resolution is permitted. As mentioned, rate limiting, we've touched on. Some blacklists, I won't go through more. YAML, we get free telemetry, we get free metrics. And there are various other things on the way. And I think this means that we just about have time to go through Istio threats and issues. So, see if this works. Uh, this is a talk, um, this is a slice of another talk that uh, our head of security, Rowan Baker, delivered last week. 
and looks at some of the things that Istio doesn't quite uh, cover yet. Of course, if you mess up the control plane configuration for something that is defined entirely as YAML, um, you're going to be in a sticky situation. Um, our perspective on this actually is uh, use GitOps. GitOps is really cool. Um, it allows you, if you GPG sign everything, to identify the chain of trust and provenance of each line of code that hits production. And that's just not just your application code, but your cluster configuration, anything you can define as YAML. You, we use it for all our Terraform and Ansible code as well. Um, Control Plane have a white paper um, published with uh, Weaveworks coming out in the next couple of weeks on hardening Git for GitOps. Loads of extra guarantees and audit capability becomes available super nice. Um, right, the Istio sidecar is attackable from inside the network namespace. This is kind of accepted in the documentation, but it's not clearly raised. Um, this means that a container can conceivably remove itself from the mesh, and as such, traditional defense and depth is necessary. Why would you not have network policy when it's available to you? Why would you leave open cloud metadata APIs when you can run proxies like Kiam or Kube2IAM? Why would you have security groups and knackles that are wide open when you could lock them down? All these layers of abstraction are great until one chink in the armor is uh, exposed. So just because something starts on the mesh does not necessarily mean it will end on the mesh and precautions should be taken. Um, what might this do? Yeah, so of course, we can actually attack other things. If we rely on Istio's egress control to prevent data exfiltration, then um, it may not be an entirely robust strategy. Again, just addition of network controls, uh, network policy controls would help. Um, where are we? We're still attacking the sidecar. Yeah, of course, so just use network policies. Um, init containers run off mesh. What does that mean? It means that it's all very well having a pod with no init containers and a sidecar injecting a single init container, but if your pod already has init containers, they get to run first. What does that mean? That means that if I have malicious code in my init container, it gets to run off mesh. Again, what have I not secured um, on my network perimeter that I might be able to pivot to? A lot of times, init containers are the same container as the main application process with a different invocation call. Uh, there are lots of nasty ways to hack a container. One of my favorite is just mess with LD preload, and then you get a reverse shell or whatever you want every time that container starts. Um, we have to trust everything is hostile and layer defenses appropriately. Uh, what am I doing? Um, pod security policy blocks the init sidecar. Uh, we do not want to run privileged containers or allow privilege escalation or, in fact, have any... Uh, capabilities at all, but unfortunately, the injected Istio init container requires the privilege flag for OpenShift and the net admin capability, which it uses to set up pod networking. Uh, this super sucks. We may be able to fix some of this with uh, secure sub pod isolation, but that doesn't quite fit into the pod security model. The relevant engineer there is Tim Alclair, so no doubt it will at some point. Um, and I'm conscious I'm more or less at the end of time, so. All these slides are available. Um, I will tweet them out shortly afterwards. And of course, loads of this stuff is still in alpha. So on that note, let's just finish off here, if we can. Uh, yes, so there are lots of extra things coming in Istio. Um, lots of exciting things. Contributions always welcome. Thank you very much.